Okay, um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Brad Thompson. I'm Vice President of Tennessee uh, Operations here with uh, STV. Uh, STV is a, a national multimodal infrastructure consulting firm. Uh, we do planning, environmental design uh, for, for all modes of travel, uh, as well as infrastructure related to um, uh, you know, municipal infrastructure, water, wastewater, you name it. Um, so mobility, as, as we all know, uh, is dramatically changing across the Southeast. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people here uh, on your trip to Nashville, uh, how many of you use ride sharing, transit, scooters, or otherwise on this trip? Okay, show a few hands there, okay. Um, so obviously here in the South, we're very car centric. Uh, nobody, nobody can deny that. We love our cars, we love our pickup trucks and our tractors and whatever else we have to get around on. Uh, that's a hard thing to change. And, uh, um, but it is changing uh, as the region faces major growth and development pressures, uh, outside influences from people who are moving to the region. Uh, all of those things are changing the way in which we get around uh, within our urban areas as well as our rural areas. Um, so that's really kind of what this panel is here to talk a little bit about is um, those changes and how and the challenges that those things present. So um, what I'd like to do here is um, uh, start off with a, a series of questions. Um, I guess before I do that though, I'd like to give everybody just a chance real quickly, if you will, just to introduce yourselves. We'll start here with PT. P.T. Jones, um, I'm from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Sorry for the folks around the corner can't see me. I won't go into long detail because I don't want to keep us from lunch either. But um, I'm on a detail, so I'm actually on a work loan to the Department of Energy, and I work there to support a, a group uh, that's called EAMS, Energy Efficiency and uh, Mobility Systems. Hi, Jessica Dauphin, President and CEO of the Transit Alliance of Middle Tennessee. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit on a mission to build awareness and support for funding uh, multimodal transportation in Middle Tennessee. Hello again. My name is Diana Alarcon. I'm the director over the Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure. Uh, short, um, our short name is NDOT. Um, we're a new department uh, since July of 2021, um, and I look forward to having this conversation with everybody. Thank you. So it is what it is. Um, my name is Chris Lagerblum. I'm the city administrator in Alpharetta, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. Uh, I've had the privilege of managing three communities over the course of a career. Uh, Alpharetta, Georgia, Milton, Georgia, and the city of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Good morning. I'm Lydia Benda. I work at WeGo Public Transit, which is the major uh, transit provider in, um, in Nashville. And so I'm a director of engineering, construction, and project management. I work very closely with NDOT and um, also with Jessica, <laughs> the board member. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Byron Amos, Atlanta City Council member. Um, I'm chair of our transportation committee in which we have purview of our airport, our mass transit system at NDOT. Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, introduce a series of questions here directed to each of you. Uh, first up, uh, Diana, we'll, we'll, we'll call on you first. Uh, you should be warmed up. You've already, you were in session right before this, right? Um, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on um, what, a, what, a, what does a balanced and sustainable transportation network look like in, in Nashville? And, and how do we move people in a city that is, like I said, car-centric toward a more multimodal system? So I think appreciate you specifying Nashville because a balanced, sustainable transportation system is going to be different for every community. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. In Nashville, there is a need to move to uh, providing a more reliable transportation transit system, excuse me, uh, which I know Jessica is going to have an opportunity. She's very passionate about it, and I love that passion. Um, and I think it's really important for Nashville is to identify this community is growing very quickly. Um, we are having challenges of being able to move folks. We're not as bad as Atlanta yet um, in Alpharetta, <laughs> but uh, we are on our way. And so it's uh, learning lessons of what they've done or have not done and how we can do it. So I think for us, I had mentioned that there's actually going to be a referendum in November 5th. Um, on the for voting where we're looking for a dedicated transportation um, funding um, that will go toward improving reliable transit 
um, system, may, um, as well as um, 24, because we have become a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week um, city. Um, and we, it'll also provide for dollars to do some major infrastructure improvements that we're really behind on. So for us, it's, it's important to improve the transit um, reliability and convenience. It's important to also make sure we're maintaining the appropriate capacity on the roadways for all of that infrastructure. We have a very strong pedestrian element built into, especially in our entertainment districts, that we need to make sure is safe and as well as we are just really building out our bikeway initiatives. Um, and that is a bit of a challenge because, again, we're sharing the road with so many different modes. How do you make it all fit? So it's uh, using complete street initiatives, um, working very closely with your community and understanding what it is. And just one real quick thing um, on building it out. It is very easy to come into a city that is young and build a balanced transportation system. It's very hard to retrofit a city to a balanced transportation system. So a lot of conversations and a lot of engagement is really important. And I, if you, in the prior session, I talked about benefits. It's also making sure you're really sharing the benefits and the reasons why you are doing this. Um, because I, if we were to try to build out roads um, to fit the capacity needs of, of cars, we'd be like Houston and Dallas, which right now is just building interstates over top of interstates. And every time they do that, their land use grows. And every time your land use grows, you're building more need of uh, moving. So if you're not looking at other modes being part of the solution, you're just gonna continue to do that and you're gonna have a six story highway system in order to move folks or you're gonna be tearing buildings down. So land use is really important part of transportation and a balanced sustainable system. As an old school transportation land use planner, I really appreciate you saying that, by the way, because I think that's still something that goes unnoticed and the induced demand that you talk about that comes as a result from infrastructure investments. So very good point. And, and I guess, uh, Chris, Diana mentioned multiple, obviously, uh, multiple modes of transportation. Tell us a little bit about, in your mind, how the, those things fit together in a purposeful way that connects users. Yeah, so when we look at transportation and, and people's mobility, it's it's uh, I always look at it in the, from the perspective of is it connected and is it uh, is it flexible and does it work with with each other? Uh, I know Diana compared us to uh, or Nashville to Atlanta, but I've got to say whoever designed the traffic in Chattanooga uh, designed it such that they didn't want Georgians to travel to Tennessee and didn't want Tennesseans to travel to Georgia. So. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure who designed the, the travel through Chattanooga, but um, anyway, it is what it is. So, it, having done this now, uh, you've know, been in the business of planning cities, uh, the health of cities, watching cities grow for the last three decades um, in a couple of different states. Um, the focus has always been, and, and the focus still needs to be on on flexibility and connectedness, um, because not any of these systems, not any of these modes, happen in a vacuum. And we found that as we develop trail systems versus road systems versus uh, things that we don't even know are going to exist yet in, in transportation, um, we've got to have that flexibility to ma make sure that they all work together. Uh, Diane and I had the opportunity at, at uh, one point to serve together in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And uh, I'll take you back to a real life example there that happened where we didn't have flexibility and connectedness. And that was when um, a modern day, at the time, streetcar was designed. Uh, to traverse downtown Fort Lauderdale. By the time it was designed and by the time it was ready to be implemented, there was about 12 years that were between the concept and the implementation. And when we got to the implementation 12 years later, we ended up not doing it because um, it was not then cutting edge at the time. And, uh, you know, the flexibility to, to see the future and see how, uh, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll stay with that flexibility and, and connectedness just because we're not sure what's coming, but we know it all has to work together. Thank you, Chris. And, and, and Byron, uh, your experience in Atlanta obviously is a little different than it is in Nashville. Uh, uh, although, like you said, I, I, it seems like sometimes it feels like we're headed that way toward Atlanta. Uh, the, um, you know, one of the things we, we talked about is, you know, the, the connectedness of the various activities and things. And, uh, one of the things I know you all are dealing with is, is on the bike lane side of things. Um, tell us a little bit about how you're addressing the, the lacking bike lane and the, 
the just general multimodal connectivity as it relates to more specifically even demographics that are continually evolving here in the southeast? Well, you know, just like everyone else said, it, it is a challenge even for Atlanta. I mean, realizing what we do downtown Atlanta has a ripple effect um, every, every place else. Um, you know, dealing with a bike lane and dealing with a city in which you already said, we are not getting out of our cars, not as of right now. Um, but there are still residents that are moving in that are expecting not only bike lanes, but dedicated, protected bike lanes. Um, which which adds to a whole nother level. Um, one of the things the city experiences as well is we have a lot of state routes that run through um, our community and our neighborhood. So we have to deal with the state on, on that level. But understand how everything connects and how we move forward. Um, I had to back our transportation committee back up to understand the first mode of transportation and ask, did we have sidewalks? Long before we get to bike lanes, that first mile, how are people going to walk from where they're going to go to get to that bike lane and things of that nature? So we're looking systematically at our streets to see what we can do bike lanes on, what we can do shared um, participation on as far as bike lanes and cars as well. Do we protect it? And then also with those major thoroughfares we have running through, how do you get across that four lane state highway with that bike lane, it, it doesn't exist. So that goes into the synchronization of lights and things of that nature. So just paying attention to everything we're doing, but more importantly, being intentional about what we do. And then also just want to say to all my elected official um, counterparts that are here, thank you. Because once all of you experts get through doing your work and the analysis, if there's not at least one policymaker that is speaking the same language that you're speaking, then the lift becomes even harder. So as we talk about Vision Zero, uh, I drive a Suburban. So, you know, Vision Zero and Suburbans really don't go together. But, um, you know, <laughs> but if there's not at least one policymaker that, that can translate what you're saying to, to budget and policy and, and implementation and to make it work, I think the lift is, is that much harder. But bike lanes is definitely coming. Autonomous vehicles, we have way more um, mapping our streets right now. Um, but for, for a growing population of young people and an elderly population that still drive their cars, we're still faced with that challenge on what to do, but more importantly, what to do better. Thank you. And you know, you mentioned policymakers. One of the big things that I know Jessica's gonna have a hard time refraining from talking about here is the referendum that's coming up that, that Diana mentioned. and. Uh, but, uh, but Jessica, I'd like to ask you um, a little bit about, you know, we're talking about sustainability as it relates to urban mobility. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what some of the threats are to that and what we could potentially do to avoid that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brad. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm loving hearing all these responses, and I just want to say that none of this really cool, awesome intentionality and um, updated mobility in urban areas happens in a vacuum. Right, we don't get a balanced and connected system by waving a magic wand, unfortunately. Um, also, we, we, or Diana, unfortunately, can't just be the sole decision maker, right? It, we, these types of infrastructure changes rely on funding, oftentimes a federal source, a state source, a local source. And that local source oftentimes has to come with a tax increase or some sort of revenue increase from somewhere else. So we are tasked with educating folks, and I see that as the number one most significant challenge, is the education of elected officials, Byron, to your point, you've gotta have that elected official being able to translate the needs into benefits and to the steps forward. But you also have to educate your voters. So that's two very different constituencies or audiences that you're tasked with trying to help understand and lead them into becoming some sort of expert in this that we, you have all spent years learning um, and, and that. So, um, and that matters because we need to be well, well informed to support these initiatives. But one of the things that is oftentimes overlooked, and maybe this is because I'm a little biased by leading a nonprofit um, charged with doing just that in terms of educating both elected officials, business leaders, and voters is that there seems to be a lack of understanding of the critical need of that one piece. 
it's really hard to get folks to understand how important it is to fund that work. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to look at my notes. Give me just a second. And the, the reason why it needs funding is because oftentimes you were working with, you know, marketing, multiple programming, multiple uh, stakeholders, coalition building, um, you name it. We are out there trying to build um, that thought leadership in that ish, that that ground level understanding of an issue, so that people understand when you say, "I want to build a dedicated bike lane," they know why that's important to them, right? Otherwise, it can seem as a, well, that's not for me. But you have to help bridge that gap, um, and I, I can't stress the importance of of the community involvement enough. And that goes back to your intentionality, right? You're not just moving in and saying, we're gonna do this in your neighborhood, you're working with them. We're here with you, we hear your challenges, and we wanna make it better, and here's how we can do that. I just wanna say, I just got back from San Jose, California, and I got to tour the, um, the Valley Transit Authority from soup to nuts, and I am incredibly jealous. <laughs> they have some really great facilities out there. They have a ton of protected bike lanes, they have light rail, a, a true multimodal system. Um, the thing that blew my mind the most was we toured the BART transit station in Melita. It's a beautiful station, huge. It's a big transportation hub. It's not just for BART, it's also for bus and light rail in a town of 80,000 people. Now, I know that we in this room understand how mind-blowing that is. For comparison, Nashville is over 800,000 people. Do we have a train station? No. We, we, have, we don't have a big major hub like that. We, we have the Riverfront Station with the WeGo Star. Sorry, Lydia, and she can, she can scold me <laughs> later. But for a town of 80,000 people to have such a huge and, and uh, sweeping multimodal transportation hub, and that was not just the only one, um, versus a city of over 800,000, which is the heart of an entire 10-county region here, to not even have a BRT, or anything nearing that level of access and accessibility and convenience and all of the things we're talking about was mind blowing. And the one thing I can imagine that is disconnecting us is the ability to understand the value of that investment, how it connects you to cities large and small, how it connects you to workforce, to education, to training, to to housing, to how it supports strategic development, how it supports affordability, how it supports access to healthcare and uh, a better physical uh, well-being, um, a whole host of things, how it supports environmental sustainability for your city and Vision Zero. Um, there's a ton of reasons why this is so important and so the highest, most um, difficult challenge is educating that across stakeholders. I agree completely. Uh, I was, in fact, having a uh, discussion earlier this week with some of my uh, friends at TDOT, actually, and we were talking about that, that, you know, we do a lot of things really well. We plan, we design well, we do all those things. One of the things we don't do very well, in my opinion, is we don't promote and market, you know, what we have and how to utilize those things as well as we could. Um, and and what I'm, where I'm going with that is, for example, when you're, when you're doing a, a plan or a corridor study, you come up with alternative that you, you know this alternative is going to, it's going to fix a problem, right? Well, then it almost has to become a marketing exercise at that point. Get out there, talk to people, explain why it's the solution, explain why it's a silver bullet if it is. You know, that's one of the things I feel like in our industry uh, as a whole, we don't do a, a good enough job of. Explain it consistently, comprehensively, over and over and over again. You know, um, people tend to need to hear a piece of information seven to nine times before they internalize it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 
Well, great. Well, what I'd like to do now is give Lydia a chance to uh, defend the WeGo star. No, no I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, no, but, 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 but again, you know, it, keeping in mind, um, you know, there's the policy side, there's the, you know, the educational side that you were talking about. There's also the funding side of things, but, and all these things are important as it relates to the infrastructure that we need. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the things you're doing and you're seeing as it relates to uh, advanced technologies, uh, real t real time transit information. What are some of the things you're doing here and what you're seeing in the industry? Thank you, Brad. I um, just echoing what Jessica said and, and others have said, it's so important to educate the public on the benefits of transit and um, in order for us to get to the point where transit will really be beneficial for so many people and attract more riders, we have various infrastructures that need to be in place. You've got foundational infrastructure. Several times people have talked about sidewalks. I mean, it's a basic thing to be able to walk from your front door out to um, a sidewalk, a safe sidewalk, ADA compliant sidewalk, to get to a, a transit stop. Um, tra so sidewalks and bikeways are so important um, in that multimodal connection between you know, pedestrians and bicyclists and bus riders or, you know, other vehicles. Um, that's part of the foundational infrastructure that we need. Um, and then, of course, to increase um, bus service, not only to the, the number of routes, but the, um, uh, the range of those routes and the frequency of that, you know, um, as part of the Tran transportation referendum that's coming to vote in November, um, there are four key pieces to that. One is sidewalks, the second is increasing bus service, and then signals, improving the signal situation, and um, that all leads to improved safety, <coughs> so that vision zero aspect of it. Um, so the basic foundation of infrastructure, sidewalks, bikeways, increased bus service, and then, then you can get to the next level of, um, uh, of improving trans transit signal priority and tr improving your signals. And there's a lot of infrastructure that's needed in order to get to that point. You have to have um, fiber optic cable to go from the tra traffic management center out to the intersection controllers. Um, you also need to have all of the buses have GPS equipment to communicate their location to that traffic management center. And then you have um, software that gets, gathers all that data and can communicate um, that information to back to the signals to create um, a pathway for the bus to get through the signal in a timely way so that the buses can be on time um, and have reliability of service. So with um, with those pieces of infrastructure, then we can communicate to the public what's going on on the bus system, and they can um, either through a web um, web access or an, an app on your phone, or at the bus stations themselves to have real time signage that they can know when the bus next bus is coming. That also needs to be connected to. Um, the roadway network, if there's a detour that needs to happen or if there's roadway, you know, we talked about um, impacts on the safety of, of work zones on the roadways. So that information all has to be collected to be able to provide um, the transit rider with the information that he or she needs to make an informed decision. Um, so with foundational infrastructure and with advanced infrastructure and uh, with proper user interfaces, um, we can be able to communicate that information to the public. They can make wiser decisions about um, how to plan their journey and that will help to increase um, urban mobility. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Lydia. Um, and, and that's coming from someone who knows it firsthand, uh, working there with WeGo. So you, you know the, the importance of that. Um, I want to switch gears here a little bit. Uh, we've got an interesting, interesting perspective when we were on the call the other day talking about this. Uh, PT comes from a, a little bit of different, a different angle. Uh, 
work with Oak Ridge National Lab and really more on the, on the transportation research side of things. Um, and Pete, you had a lot, a lot to talk about the other day and I hope, hopefully you'll bring some of that today as well. But you know, tell us a little bit about how the government in general on your side of things goes about figuring out which transport technolo transportation technologies they want to spend their money on from a research standpoint. And then kind of in general, what is kind of the target market slash audience uh, for how those dollars are spent? Target audience is a tough part, so I'll leave that for the last. Okay. Um, I, I will, of course, state that, that I do not work for the Department of Energy directly. Yeah. So don't come to me and ask for funding because I can't give you any. <laughs> um, but I do know some people that might be interested, and, and that's probably one of the biggest things. And we've talked a little bit about uh, lexicon, about taxonomy, you know, the, the understanding of the words and what they really mean. And that's one of the biggest things we have to figure out is, is perspective. Because when you got Mayberry, you know, with, with one stoplight, and you got Nashville or Atlanta with, you know, a, a very different complex systems, you can't go in on policy and say everybody needs to dictate X amount of percentage to the budget because that's not going to work really well when instead you got to feed kids in Mayberry instead of worrying about an advanced transportation system. Um, I get in fun arguments and you guys can share this so the people didn't stick around before lunch to say, you know, electric buses are, are terrible for efficiency. And people get mad at me. It's like, well, if it's full, it's great. But if it's empty, it's worthless. And I worked for a bus company for a while, electric bus company. It was a really exciting experience and, and lots of fun. And, and the government invested a lot of money in that over the 10 years before they went belly up a few years ago. But the point is really how to identify the priorities because that resource pool is small. So the, the team that I work for in the vehicle technologies office, they spend a lot of time trying to identify and prioritize, usually along administrative guidelines, um, where they need to really invest the most money and have the biggest long-term impact. So a lot of you guys are looking at, you know, 10, 15 years. Some of the things on the DOE, they're looking at 50, 100 years, believe it or not. Um, right now, there's a fusion reactor in France that we spend a lot of money and time on, and hopefully next year it'll be, you know, full fusion, but we'll talk about that at lunch if somebody wants to. Um, so it's really a matter of identifying uh, along priorities uh, to make sure that the technologies that they're putting out have the best likelihood of successful deployment. So deployment is a huge part of the vehicle technologies office. It's, it's not the group that I support, but um, the technology integration folks try to make sure that if somebody comes in and says, hey, we just won this award for you know 100 electric buses, can we really charge them? Because now you got to get the utilities involved to make sure that the grid is actually ready for that. You know, electricity is a commodity now. And I, I was thinking about this when the, when the folks, uh, and I spent a little time with Matt, um, um, when they talked about uh, Brownsville. And as they come in and they, and they bring a plant in, that's a big change on the grid. And this is something that you know, people forget. Grid isn't just the streets and grid isn't just the electricity, it's both now. So how do they put that together? And that's a huge uh, focus area for, for the vehicle technologies office. There's actually a group specifically on working on vehicle to grid integration. So there's, there's many different ways. And I think the biggest thing is perspective and lexicon making sure all talk on the same language. Um, it is about you know personal mobility and of course a lot of people associate cars with freedom. Um, I have to say that that I drove here. Sorry. <laughs> I, I had fun figuring out the parking. Uh, some of you folks may know there's a there's a couple of different magazines that solely focus on parking. That's all they have. I have school bus magazine you know, delivered to my office because that's a personal passion of my own. But you know, there's all these different areas where transit and transportation fall under the radar and people, customers don't recognize it's the single most important method uh, of, of culture development. Whether it's walking, Byron and I talked about that first uh, during our call. Um, you know, that's, most of us you know, start out with, with feet, but not everybody. So you get to the other discussion, and Diana talked about this before, and I'll, I'll leave on this point. The TNCs did some great things, but they also did some things we should have been prepared for. And that's when taxi companies went away, they were all ADA compliant. So all of a sudden you got a lot of people that can't get to where they need to go. They can't get to the doctor's office. They can't get to the, the store. They can't do these things. And TNCs, sometimes in East St. Louis, they won't pick up that ride. They don't want to go down there to pick those people up. So there's a lot of different things to think about and those all come into the perspective. EMAs in particular, the, the, the group that I support, lots of simulation but they also go down and actually do hardware work too. So it's a, it's a pretty broad stretch for, for the Department of Energy. Thank you, PT. Um, Diana, coming back to you, one, one of the things you mentioned too was, um, you know, 
sidewalks. I know, I know Metro Nashville has, uh, you know, NDOT has really focused on sidewalks over the past few years, and I know that's also a target for the uh, dedicated funding source if, if that were to happen. Uh, but it's interesting, our, you know, you and- When, and, when it happens. Or, when, when it happens, that's right. Uh, you and, and Lydia both were talking about the connectivity aspect in the sidewalks. Tell me a little bit about, uh, from your experience uh, in the sidewalk program, what, is, what have been some of the biggest challenges uh, for that program in, in general? Besides funding, stormwater. Stormwater, stormwater. is probably our biggest challenge. And again, you're back to infrastructure again. Um, and many cities, I, I think there's a couple things that everybody's been mentioning. First of all, every mode out there in transportation is subsidized. Everything is subsidized. How you drive, your car, whether it's a bus, a train, your walking, bike, whatever it is, it's all subsidized. And we haven't touched the gas tax dollars in decades. And so the reality is, is that we only have so much funding, both at the federal, state, and local level, and a lot of hard decisions have to be made about where that funding goes. And so that's another challenge that we run into. Uh, I have a, you know, we have some challenges with some state legislation that was written about not requiring sidewalks to be built. So that puts the onus all on the government to build the sidewalks. And the challenge is that we do not have the funding because by the time you pay for what you consider the priority services, we need to make sure that the police are there to help um, the public. We need to make sure that we have a, a very strong fire department um, that's out there to help us, as well as the medical side of it. It's also very important to make sure that we can have water running and flushing the toilets. So when you start you know, pecking things off of priorities that a city has and making sure you deliver on those core service, there's typically a little bit of money left for, for transportation initiatives. And that's why there's such a hard dependency at the local level to the state and to the federal. And if we're not talking about how to fund this across all of the modes, not just one mode, then you start seeing things fall off. And sidewalks have unfortunately been something that has fallen off. And so our biggest challenge is the cost to build sidewalks and then the uh, requirement of stormwater improvements because we wanna make sure if we're building the infrastructure, it's not gonna impact something else. We do not want water left on the roads that can cause someone to hydroplane and have a crash and get seriously injured or, or die. That'd be completely against our Vision Zero efforts. But where do you put that water? And you know, we are all having challenges with water right now, actually creating flooding issues and stuff. So there's, it's bigger than just building the infrastructure, it's where do you put it after it? I mean, they can't, it's, it flows. I mean, water's like traffic. It's going to find a way to move, and it's going to move to the lowest ground. So how do you support that so that you're also keeping that quality of life intact for the consumer and for the uh, residents? And um, I want to go back and talk about connectivity because I think that is very important. I, I've heard so many times, you know, you build a sidewalk to nowhere or you build a bike, you know, a bike lane to nowhere. And yes, that's the case, and that's been the, another challenge is building a con that connectivity that's so important. Um, so I would just say in the planning aspect, we really look at making sure we're connecting things or at least this is gonna connect to something and not just be a sidewalk to nowhere that we're waiting on maybe a development to happen or more funding to come along. That connectivity is really important um, so that people can start actually physically visualizing it. Um, and it's just not like a sidewalk sitting out in nowhere. So thank you. Thank you. We've got just a few more minutes. I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing from Chris or Byron, you all, a couple of other uh, municipalities. I know she talked a little bit about stormwater. Is, I assume the funding is obviously another issue, but are there any other issues related to your infrastructure, whether it be sidewalks or transit or, or bike lanes that you all are experiencing there locally? <clears throat> you know, the Connectivity issue is, is uh, what Diana mentioned, the building a sidewalk to nowhere accusation. That happens all the time. And um, we're always putting in sidewalks in the hopes that eventually they'll, they'll connect. Um, as far as bike lanes and, and uh, other modes of transportation, funding will always play a role in that. But I'm going to throw out just a concept that maybe nobody in this room would, would think about. And it's, it's not necessarily how you fund to build things. It's once you've built something, what the funds are um, to maintain it and keep it in good working order. Um, and so you can't just build it one time and, and, and walk away. 
um, and having managed cities now for, for years and years, um, one of the unthought costs of, of sidewalks is uh, the cost of people that get injured on them. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, amount of money that goes out of a lot of organizations for this uh, notion of a trip and fall. And with all of the lawyers that are out there and personal injury, um, we settle more trip and fall uh, claims as local government and spend more money um, making those claims go away because of the sidewalks that were built decades ago that now you know have uh, uh, trip hazards in them or they've got a hole in them. Um, and uh, I'm sure Diana deals with that here in downtown Nashville. <laughs> I was walking out down Broadway the last time I was here a month ago and I uh, remember turning to my wife and saying, well, that, that hole right there could be worth $8,000 if you just fall in it. Um, and uh, <laughs> just, just don't, don't, don't get hurt too bad. Um, um, but uh, you know, that's one of the other things that we deal with is, is the long-term costs of all of this infrastructure that we talk about having to fund to build. It's the funding that uh, also has to go into uh, making sure that it stays in good working order and safe. But uh, um, you know, the future of mobility is just so, so fascinating to me that uh, um, you know we've got. And I'm going to deviate just for a second. I promise, and I'll stop talking because I know we're running out of time. But uh, you know, a lot of the infrastructure that we've built over the years may be obsolete as we move our way into the future, and we need to be thinking about that too. We've um, built these tremendous parking decks for cars to park in. That I wonder what we do with them when we no longer have all these cars on the street to uh, to need parking decks. And if you think about a parking deck, unless you built it with a helix or some type of a speed ramp, you're dealing with uh, uh, floors that aren't level and even. And you don't convert that to something um, easily without having to go through the process of thinking to rebuild it. So the transportation systems and mobility systems that we have in place today, as they evolve and as they change, we as uh, uh, those that are running communities have to be able to be nimble enough to change with whatever modes of transportation are next. And, um, can I clarify what I mean by? <laughs> that must have been Siri. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to the council member. It's, it's ironic when um, it goes back to education when the general public think that you have all the money you need you know, Atlanta is a special place. So a week and a half after we passed our municipal auction sales tax in the last election round, we made national news with the water crisis. So the community is saying, we gave you the money, we have been able to successfully pass bond packages and things of that nature. But unfortunately, we're living in a time in which the 80, 90 year old pipes in the city of Atlanta are beginning to fail. That's what they do. If we was 50 years prior to now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So we have a community that wants us to go through the um, neighborhoods, tearing up the streets, replacing pipes. Nothing is wrong with them as of yet. But they don't realize if we tear up this street to replace that pipe, now your street is shut down. So now you definitely don't have a way to get back and forth because there's no mobility at all. But we have the money. We have a um, national level government that has been able to send money down, but people still don't understand when we're dealing with storm water. And I know you've probably seen last year when my district flooded, uh, one of our historical colleges flooded as well, dealing with storm water, dealing with sewage water, dealing with fresh water. The average public just hear pipes and water. Um, one of our most um, um, important parts, we was able to create Cook Park and national claim for the water retention and the fountains and the beauty of it. It came when 13 acres of downtown actually flooded 2003. So when it flooded about two years ago, people called the park is flooding and it was hard to explain to them that's why we built it for it to flood. Um, because if it wasn't for that, then it would be in your living room and your bedroom and things like that again. So um, it's an ongoing conversation with a landscape, physically a landscape changing, because um, now we're closing those parking lots and building hopefully affordable homes. But um, it's an ongoing conversation about education, ongoing conversation about no, we don't have enough money because that dollar you gave us last month is not the same dollar this month, it's about 95 cents now. Because uh, things keep changing. Um, so it's an ongoing conversation with sidewalks, mobility, streets, pipes, walking, mobility. All of it is, is interchangeably interconnected. Thank you. We've got about uh, three and a half minutes or, or so left. Uh, I guess Lydia, Jessica, PT, I'd like to invite you all. Anything else you'd like to offer? 
You don't have to. I'm just, you know. I, I want to. I know. Thank you. you. <laughs> so uh, I just, Byron, you, you nailed it. Councilmember, thank you for reiterating the importance of that education, that consistent, comprehensive education. Yes, we asked for that money, but that doesn't necessarily cover this new issue that we are all now facing together and explaining that it just it takes an enormous amount of effort to continuously and consistently educate people and if i could i'm just going to throw a quick pitch out for 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 the folks that uh, you know are looking for a customer expectation or a perspective most of us you know it's about time and how we move around and and the convenience factors and uh, DOE did support um, NREL uh, developing a tool called MEP, uh, Mobility, Energy, and Productivity. And if you get bored and you want to look into it, just Google NREL, N-R-E-E, -E, excuse me, one E, L, and then MEP, -E M-E-P, or Mobility, Energy, Productivity. And that gives you kind of a thought that, you know, most people don't think, oh, if I get on the bus and then it goes to this and then it's going to take me much more time. But if I drive, then I gotta figure out parking and other, so there's kind of some balances and, and it's good to help educate people. Anything you wanna add? Um, just, I think that we've talked about education and the importance of um, educating the public about options that they have. You know, a lot of people are very car-centric um, and don't even think about, well, is there another option for me to get to where I need to go? Um, and it does take some effort to get past, you know, it's easier if I have a car, it's easier for me to just hop in the car. A lot of people don't have that option. So um, in, in order for us to provide those options for, you know, across various demographics, you know, it, it helps for all of us to think about um, investing in transportation, investing, of course, in transit is, is that is um, dear, near and dear to my heart, but um, to give people options so that it will ultimately benefit all of us to, to have those options. Thank you, lady. Oh. Yeah, I just wanna say in my TEDx, I say that individual freedoms are uh, directly tied to mobility and um, that's exactly what I mean. And it doesn't matter how you do it. I know that we oftentimes are, um, when you're a pro-transit supporter, oftentimes you're, the, the assumption is that you are trying to take car keys away from people, right? But that is not at all the case. It is really looking for that ultimate safety and making sure that anyone who wants to you know get from point a to point b can do so safely and conveniently with whatever mode they choose thank you and i, I guess just to wrap up real quick um you know a lot of what we heard discussion here was uh policy funding which i would say comes to no surprise to anybody in this room but but the one thing that, that i think you hit on and we talked a lot about today that as i said you know we don't always do the best is that education you know, that's, that's one of the things I think that, that, that I personally would take home from this discussion. So I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, willingness to participate and sharing your insights. And I'm going to turn you loose to lunch right on time. So. <laughs>